Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Global Symposium organized by the MSAAD class of 2006. My name is Leslie Kuo, Associate Director of Development and Alumni Relations. And I'm pleased to introduce the program and even more excited to introduce this cohort of practitioners to the broader GSAP community as they present work that details how they engage with issues of social, environmental, and cultural importance through design. Based in 11 different countries and working with an even greater number of communities, we learn about local conditions that will inform the challenges and solutions unique to the communities in which they each work. We're now starting the first of three presentations today. Johnny Chu, based in Taiwan, will be moderating. Johnny Chu, the founder of JC Architecture and Out Scholarship, recognized for his fresh perspective and concept-driven work. He is the first Taiwanese designer to win World Architecture Festival inside World Interior of the Year. His other accolades include Red Dot, Best of the Best, Design Award, the International Architecture Award, New York Interior Design Best of the Year Award, and many more. The firm is also being voted top 25 architectural firms in Taiwan in their 10th year and selected for 40 under 40 awards by Perspective Global. His provocative and unconventional design have made him a key figure in, in defining design in Taiwan and is often invited to jury panels of esteemed design competitions such as the US's International Interior Design Award. He also often guest lectures at many universities, including this prestigious Royal College of Art in London. His latest adventure includes a train design for Taiwan Railway, which also just received the Good Design Award from Japan, and is currently pursuing an architecture PhD degree from RMIT. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for being one of the core coordinators of this program today, and um, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I think it's a really unique opportunity that um, due to COVID that we are able to meet um, the students and the alumni and also hopefully the professors and then to demonstrate what we've been doing after 15 years of the school, exactly 15 years. Um, I know the commencement and the graduation is coming up soon. So this is a little celebration and then give a sense of hope um, and also hopefully we can provide job opportunities um, to the graduation students. Uh, we really want to show with the, the 21, 22 speakers our different talents and advice, uh, the vast diversity expertise that we have um, through maybe development or government works or private sector works. It's, I think it just shows how uh, GSAP allow us and cater us with these, all this professional expertise that we are able to carry on forward uh, for the past 15 years. Um, and, but this is also an opportunity for us to share each of our, um, and understand what each of our own abilities are. And then, so hopefully we can work internationally and cross national boundaries. Um, and then how we'll be able to help each other. I think that was, will be also a key uh, thing inside this symposium. And you now we're just here to connect and we connect and have a very good time. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, um, Adula. He's the Managing Director of Shape Architecture Practice. Uh, all of us graduate from uh, MSAD 06. And Shape Architecture is uh, uh, based in UAE and is founded in 2006. So. I think after straight after Colombia, and it's dedicated to set example of excellence in design in the Middle East. So it's very interesting for me to see how Middle East is thinking and how shape lies and shape the forms. I know you have uh, a lot of production technologies in the design process, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, thank you, and take it away, Abdullah. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Johnny and Leslie. I'll just share my, my screen. Um, uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. 
Okay, um, thank you, um, John, for the introduction. Um, uh, after graduating from, uh, from Colombia, I worked briefly in uh, New York, and then I decided to go back to the UAE and open my own practice, uh, which is called Shape Architecture Practice and Research. Uh, at Shape, we have uh, all, um, all sorts of projects from residential, uh, 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 residential projects, interior, commercial, uh, cultural, hospitality, as well as transportation and urban design. Um, we also have been, uh, I have been selected as one of the 15 most influential people in architecture in the region for two years uh, in a row. Uh, some of our projects have been also highly commended and uh, nominated for awards. Um, or shortlisted for awards. Uh, today, I would like to talk. I'll be speaking, uh, talking about uh, or presenting uh, two projects. Uh, the first project is called the Rainy Room. Um, it's a collaboration with the Space Continuum. Uh, the Rainy Room is um, is is a is a uh, is a pavilion that is hosting a single art uh, permanent uh, art installation called the basically Rainy Room. Hence the name uh, by Random International. Uh, the the simple volumetric representation of the building is in contrast with the very busy commercial uh, uh, center in Sharjah, as well as the uh, architecturally busy area in Sharjah. So the idea was to have something that is simple, straightforward, and attract the people as well, uh, by being. By contrasting with the with the surrounding, and with and play with the between the uh, relationship between interior exterior by bringing elements of the the uh, surrounding urban um, context into the space uh, as well as materiality into the building. Um, so as you walk through the the, uh, the walkways or corridors that takes you from a very lit uh, space to to a darker uh, ramp that takes you down to that dark room, which is for which is where the installation happens, and there and then you end up into that dark room where the where basically where the installation is. Uh, the rain room basically it's um, it's where you get to experience you, uh, it's an immersive experience of rain where you you walk through the rain with cameras and sensors. You won't get wet if you walk in the right speed, and basically that's how you experience rain. And it's it's also it's contract. Well, um, it has a little bit um, more meaning in UAE since rain is a bit scarce um, and so on. Uh, in terms of plan, the, the of course the main space is the installation space and everything around it is uh, ser servicing, uh, servicing that space. These are um, sections showing the different levels and organization of the space. Um, Um, this, uh, we, we got second place for the best cultural project of the year um, uh, three years ago. As well, this project has been published uh, regionally and as well as internationally in, uh, in the Z. Uh, the second project um, that I would like to talk to about is the Emirates Emer Diplomatic Academy. The Emirates Diplomatic Academy basically is um, it's a, it's a university or a college that basically uh, is teaching um, is basically graduate where uh, young diplomat graduate as well as existing diplomats that take continuing education courses and so on into into the in that let's say college or academy uh, the, uh, and uh, frequently it's been it's visiting uh, visited by uh, ambassadors ministers as well as sometimes even heads of um, uh, prominent state figures from around the world um, to give lectures within the its premises. Um, the idea of the of the academy is uh, around the central uh, agora, the agora from the um, from the um, times, and uh, the agoras have been um, divided uh, throughout. We have internal, external ones, and also on different levels, uh, and so on. Um, the building is is uh, basically wrapped with a with an aluminium uh, aluminium uh, skin that has been bent and perforated to reduce solar heat gain as well as reduce the glare or eliminate glare from from the building. At the same time, uh, provide uh, enough ambient lighting to uh, or enough lighting to eliminate the interior spaces. 
this is these are renderings of the, of the building as well as a nice shot. Uh, this project is currently under uh, final stages of construction. I will be showing some images of this project. The project is um, um, with the sustainability uh, has been taken for, uh, into consideration while designing the project. So uh, it's, it's rated to Peril in UAE, which is something equivalent to um, lead silver in the US. Uh, we're talking about the new silver rating, not the previous or the old ratings. Um, Accelerating. So, talking more about the facade. Um, so, um, as in, I talked about reducing the solar heat gain and glare and so on, we developed multiple equations to optimize the use of the materials as well as uh, give the building its unique character with the poles and vents uh, within the aluminum, uh, aluminum uh, sheets. So, we developed these equations and came up with uh, four modules that that um, inhabits the, the, the facade without having any cut pieces or, um, or, with, or wasted materials or, uh, and so on. Uh, also, perforation had been studied to avoid the glare. At the same time, give enough lighting for the, um, for the spaces inside, um, the, inside the building. Uh, these are more cups that we, uh, uh, we did for the, for the for the vent and perforated sheets. Uh, you can see at some, uh, the right image how it, that the perforation would look from the, from the inside. Uh, and I think the success of the selection of this material is that uh, to meet our design intent is that depending on the, how, uh, the angle you, you, you view the facade and the direction of the sunlight at a certain time, it becomes very either very opaque or very transparent, um, very um, see-through. I mean, or very transparent, depending on the the angle, um, the angle of view. And that's I think the, uh, we're successful at achieving this. This is another view from the um, let's see what the what they call the VIP entrance, where you have enough foliage to provide shade from the hot sun uh, in the UAE. Uh, this is the interior. Um, uh, atrium. Um, again, with the uh, gathering areas, uh, student gathering areas, and, and so on, uh, happening throughout at, at multiple levels. Uh, we introduced this um, staircase at the trap around the building, encouraging a more healthier uh, lifestyle and encouraging movement and, and so on uh, within the building. Uh, these are renders of the classrooms with um, um, smart um, touch screens as well as um, writable uh, walls. Uh, the furniture has been selected so that multiple arrangements within the classes can be done depending on the discussion class or a lecture and, or, and so on. Um, these are the, uh, other spaces within the, the building. This is the executive lounge uh, within the building and the boardroom. Uh, now I'll go through some of the construction um, uh, images that, um, that that we took recently from the project. Uh, you can see from the different images that each um, facade read, reads differently depending on the again the view and the angle of the sun. Uh, uh, here we're doing some testing for the for the facade lighting, uh, controlling the aiming intensity of the light. Uh, this is a view of the atrium uh, in the construction. You can see all these cranes working all at the same time. Uh, the the deadline was um, was very near, and every, they have to work all at the same time. This is the atrium during the day. This is what I call the um, the wooden uh, um, the wooden uh, draped drip, draped wall. Uh, this um, behind this is the basically the multi purpose hall. That still has um, um, retractable seating that has not been installed yet. The elevator lobbies, some views from the upper level in the atrium. The classroom almost done. Still, some final touches needs to be done to it. The view from the executive office. Here you can see clearly the perforation how it reads from uh, from the interior from the inside. Uh, so that's basically uh, what I have, uh, what I, I would like to present today. Um, 
the use of technology and so on. Basically, I didn't have time, enough time to really go into details into that, but that's part of our work. Uh, all our projects are done through uh, BIM, and we use also scripting and programming to optimize the design and its processes and, and so on. Uh, thank you for your time. If you'd like to see more of uh, our work, you can visit our website at sheep.ae. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Abdullah. Impressive and huge. Yeah, I was able to visit um, Dubai last before COVID. It's too bad we didn't get a chance to meet. We'd love to visit some of your buildings. So we'll leave all the Q and A to the back. Um, if there are any questions, welcome to put in the chat group, and then we'll try and answer it. So our third speaker is uh, Carl. So Carl Wadia. Okay, Carl Wadia is a senior associate at Architect Hafez Contract Contractor. Um, he graduated from the Academy of Architecture in Mumbai in 2003 and then post uh, Columbia in 2006. He now heads a team of approximately 70 associates, what's popularly known as the Carl Group at AHC. Um, and he has some distinguished projects such as the DB Osha Tower in Mumbai, the ICC Towers in Mumbai, the uh, Manipal University in Japan. And um, yeah, we look forward to his work. Welcome, Carl. Thank you, John. Sorry, Carl, to interrupt. Abdullah, I think you might have to stop your sharing in, in case Carl wants to uh, share his screen as well. So thank you, Johnny, uh, for the good introduction and uh, Abdullah, wonderful work. Uh, you know where you know where you are and what you're doing, and uh, you know just a word out to Priyam, a good friend at the the GSAP, and we're going to miss her today, but I'm sure we can uh, see her work some other time as well. I just hope she gets well soon. I'm going to pull up my presentation now. So is my screen visible, Johnny? Yes, good, all good. Okay, wonderful. So uh, thank you everyone for logging in and uh, spending some time uh, to, to, you know, to see what we've all been doing for the last 15 years. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about uh, four projects. Uh, project number one, two, three have been designed in lockdown and uh, they're all design competitions. All these four have been projects we've won through the design competition route. Um, and project number four is actually the first project or the second project that uh, I was, I had an opportunity to be a part of as soon as we graduated from, uh, from Colombia and came back to India. So pretty much the most recent work, whereas uh, number four captures the oldest work that uh, we did about 10, 15 years ago. So the first, uh, the first thing is that all of these four projects are in different parts of the country. And like it is in any large country, uh, you have different climatic conditions, uh, different geopolitical and uh, you know, the demographics in different parts of the country. So the, the first project, which is uh, the Indian Institute of Management is in the city of Calcutta, now known as Kolkata. Uh, it is uh, the second most uh, premier management institute in India and a pretty hard fought competition that we did uh, last June in COVID and uh, we won it. Um, the second project is a very large urban redevelopment in the city of Mumbai uh, in what is known as E-Block e in BKC. Uh, it's the financial hub of the city of Mumbai or at least it's trying to be. Uh, the third one is a design competition we won for the National Maritime Museum of India. Uh, uh, you know, it's just recently we won it and we're still designing or let's say redesigning this building. And the fourth project is 
the Bits Pilani Institute in Rajasthan, which is a hot and dry desert region of India, and uh, also a project which is set in a historic campus. So uh, starting with the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. Calcutta is a city which has an extremely high groundwater table. So you often come across sites which have 25 to 30% of the site filled with water. And this water goes up and down by a couple of feet uh, every year. And most of Calcutta and, and the, you know, the Bay of Bengal and Bangladesh, all of these areas are uh, Bay areas. So every year, some amount of land is lost to the sea and uh, it's very hard to reclaim land over here. So we got this, we inherited this site uh, which had an island in the center on which historically the Institute 40 years ago had built their academic uh, buildings and all around it was water. And there was also this uh, intrinsic canal system that connected different portions of the site. But essentially uh, what we got and you're looking at a master plan is a site which, on which buildings had been placed uh, with no real strong master plan intention. And what that sort of uh, ended up being is we got these two little corner portions, uh, the one building on the left, where uh, we had to add an academic building for almost 2000 students. And on the top right of your screen, uh, there was a water pond in a funny squarish shape. Uh, and we had to sort of redefine its shape. And with whatever land was available, we sort of had to string a building out of it and you know, make the best of uh, the, the perimeter and the circumference that we created for ourselves. Uh, so what we did is we, we, didn't, we could not challenge the master plan, let's put it that way, uh, because some of these, these water bodies are as deep as 30 meters deep, and uh, fortunately they're fresh water. So with, with the space that was available to us in a functioning campus, we had to uh, design a building. So what you see on the top left of your screen is the, uh, the adjacencies of all the buildings that existed on campus. Uh, you had all these white blocks and that blue dotted line indicates uh, the plot which was available for the new academic building. So immediately what we did is we decided uh, not to block the convocation port with its adjacency to the waterfront. So we, we, did, an, we did a building which was elevated off the ground by about 10 meters. Uh, we kept the entire stilt open uh, for circulation, pedestrian movement, all of that. And we, we did a building from third, fourth, fourth, fifth, and sixth floor onwards. So the, the whole ground plane stays open and uh, you have a building elevated above. This sat quite beautifully on the lake front. And uh, one of the challenges was given the availability of the site, this was a dead east-west facing building. And when you design buildings in India, you have to be very cognizant of which direction it faces uh, if you have any conscience in trying to do a, a sustainable building. So what we did is we kept all the classrooms on the inside or the, or the teaching blocks on the inside and we kept all the circulation on the outside. Uh, and because of budget constraints, uh, we could not uh, air condition the circulation spaces. So we, we actually uh, masked the facade in this uh, GKD stainless steel mesh. In terms of the elevation of the building and uh, the structural system and why it looks the way it does is we designed this building uh, during pandemic and uh, we wanted to design a building which could be more or less prefabricated and brought to the site. Uh, and so the material we chose was steel. Uh, steel is not a very widely accepted material in India, but in the east of the country, especially Calcutta, there's a very good heritage of doing steel buildings. So this is the image you see of the elevated building. All of the structure is uh, what it is. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, uh, trying to hide the structure. You get intense rain in this part of the country. So you have to shield all your open spaces also in a way that uh, all of the internal spaces don't get wet. And the idea of uh, connecting the internal convocation port through the new building out to the water promenade was achieved by doing this. Uh, as you walk from the old courtyard through our building to the promenade, you have this grand staircase that comes down and meets the ground plane. 
and students can directly enter the building, the heart of the building from this staircase. Uh, uh, also, it, it works beautifully uh, because I, I don't have that view today, but you also get a screen where, uh, you know, all sorts of things can be televised. This is how the building looks at night. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, this is the GKD screen mesh uh, with all of the academic spaces recessed in the back. So we get adequate shading, beautiful lighting, and the whole ground plane is, is open. The next building we had to design on this campus was the student residences. And like I explained, uh, you can see on the bottom right of the screen, uh, there was a uh, there was a squarish or an octagonal shaped pond. Uh, so what we did is we just slightly changed the shape of that pond, and we uh, essentially uh, you know uh, the, the way you wear a ring on your finger, we put a building around that, and we used the perimeter to create an interesting built form. Now these kind of buildings get tricky because uh, again you have to you know you have to make sure of how the acoustics works and how the whole internal space works. And you have a building which faces all directions, not south, east, west. So there is different treatment of windows and facades for each face of this building. But the, the image on the top right of your screen will give you an idea of how students actually enter the building. So they just enter on foot and they can move through the building and access any floor that uh, they essentially live on. So this is an aerial image of that building. Uh, it's one building, but it's divided in about five parts with uh, pedestrian walkways and connections right up and down the building. So imagine uh, about uh, 1,500 students with about 200 families in the left-hand side wing, all living, but all having different egress and ingress paths uh, to make this building activated. So this is a one-year program for MBA in which, uh, you know, uh, getting people together is important as, as part of the, the success of the program. All of the inaccessible terraces were used for solar panels, of course. This is the internal space, the grand space. So you have undergrads, undergraduates, postgraduates, and the shared space in between all of them, as well as the ground level pedestrian promenades that sort of weave in and out of all the spaces in between. Uh, we did some other interesting uh, additions to this campus. Um, the image on the top left uh, sort of puts you in about a third floor, uh, somewhere in between the building. So, you know, at every floor, there are these, these breakout spaces. Uh, and then the image on the top right puts you in at that middle balcony or the middle terrace that looks over both ends of the campus. Uh, given that it rains for almost 250 years in, in Calcutta, uh, we, we designed what is, you know, what we call the smart chata. Chata is the Hindi word for umbrella. So it's an inverted umbrella uh, that was five meters in height, 12 meters by 12 meters in plan uh, that collected rainwater. We, we plugged a solar panel on top of it. Uh, it, would, it would also be the perfect mounting pole for all your Wi-Fi, lighting, camera, security, all of that for the campus. And the most important function is that it connected every part of the campus uh, with covered walkways. So it became a sort of feature of the campus while also being highly functional. That's what the bottom two images show. Next project I'm gonna talk about is, a, uh, is completely different. It's an urban uh, redesign or a redevelopment of an existing uh, large, it's a 20 hectare site in uh, Bandra Kurla complex in Mumbai. It sits on the Miti River uh, and it's connected by, uh, by two metro lines. Uh, you can see the two different, the red one and the blue one, which are both under construction. It's also connected by some very important uh, highways. And the Miti River, this, this portion of the Miti River is, uh, is known for its, uh, uh, the undergrowth of uh, trees that it has, the mangroves. And the mangroves in India, in the environmental uh, sustainability ethos of India, mangroves are a protected plant species. So it was very important to you know, respect the mangroves, but exactly opposite to our site, uh, just across the river, there is a nature park called Maharashtra Nature Park, in which there are a lot of uh, seasonal birds and all that come to this campus, uh, to, this, to this park. So part of the design brief was to uh, to create this world-class business destination 
and also create a connection over to the Maharashtra Nature Park. So what we did is uh, we elevated the whole ground plane. Uh, the elevated ground plane got connected to both the metro lines, uh, as you can see on the left. Uh, we created this large art plaza. And one of the things that uh, the city of Mumbai suffers from is what we like to call uh, boundary wall architecture. Every building is within a boundary wall fenced up like many uh, countries in the East. So we wanted to create this campus that had no boundaries and uh, people could walk uh, across all portions of the campus. And uh, the design for the, the bridge across the Miti River was done in such a way that we planted only two columns in the riverbed, uh, therefore uh, taking care of the mangroves. And uh, we, we did this reverse suspension cable design uh, which automatically meant that the bridge in plan would become an S-shaped bridge, which means people going from one end of the business district to the Maharashtra Nature Park would actually enjoy the journey. Uh, that's hence the statement: journey is as important, is less important, is is, is as important as the destination. So that was the whole ethos behind uh, the connectivity. Uh, Given that this project would be developed over many, many years by different private public partnerships, we had we went about setting up architectural controls uh, for the whole uh, campus. So all the buildings, uh, the bottom one thirds would be cut back to allow maximum light and cross ventilation uh, across all of the pedestrian spaces. Uh, this meant that uh, we had to bring in the diagrid system of architecture into the facade design of the building. Uh, so this was all demonstrated and put as part of our design entry, which helped us towards the end. And also it meant a beautiful cross ventilation and clear line of sight at the uh, at, at what we like to call the E-deck level at ground floor. So these are just some images of uh, what the whole master plan submission looks like. Uh, eventually, when these buildings do get developed, uh, keeping the, uh, the diagrid system and the ground floor intact, the facades of the buildings could be this or it could be something else. As this was a master planning exercise that I suppose we took too seriously, let's put it that way. So we even came up with a model building of how we could consume all the GFA space and how that would uh, work at ground floor. And uh, these are some images of how it looks on uh, as it abuts the street, all of the pedestrian spaces in between the image, uh, this next image shows you a connection to the elevated city park station. And the last image is from the Maharashtra Nature Park. Uh, you could get a direct pedestrian connection from the park over the pedestrian bridge and directly to the uh, elevated uh, metro station, thereby kind of activating the site as well as activating the park. Uh, the next project is the National Maritime Heritage Museum in Lothal, Gujarat. Uh, so this is a museum that covers uh, India's maritime history uh, from almost uh, 4000 BC, where, where we had the Indus Valley civilization to the model to the modern, uh, you know, to the modern Navy. So it's a museum that had to be designed uh, at a location which was just a kilometer away from an old archeological site, which, is, which itself is about uh, two and a half thousand BC. So keeping in mind uh, that archeological history, and what's unique about this site is that this used to be a port town uh, for the Indus Valley civilization. They used to trade with the, uh, you know, uh, with the Mediterranean. But as the, as the sea receded over almost 2000 years, this, this site got landlocked and could no longer function as a port town. But the previous image on the top left, you can see was the uh, oldest and largest uh, tidal dock that is created uh, in, in, in BC. So keeping all this heritage in mind and also keeping the fact that uh, this site gets flooded uh, every year in monsoon, uh, we created this, uh, this museum, which you see on the top right, uh, which was connected to this massive urban interchange and uh, we used the flood waters that would enter the site every year. We channeled it into this very interesting mix of canals and uh, you could access all parts of the museum as well as the south southern end of the site, which has hotels and eco resorts and all of that to help the museum flourish because this is a very 
uh, you know, far out space uh, from the main city. And, uh, you know, keeping the maritime theme, but also trying to respect uh, the old Harappan and Indus Valley uh, architectural style. So the entire museum is planned in rammed earth, uh, which is a material that uh, we are still uh, studying. Uh, these are some of the images of the dock and the jetty ways and how you enter the museum. Uh, this, these are all the architectural inspirations uh, to sort of take inspiration from the old step wells in India, Gujarat, which you see on the left, as well as create these wonderful aquatic and maritime experiences of going below water, on, you know, above water, etc. And also trying to use a material which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, appropriate in terms of history and excavation and, you know, finding your way around things. So these are what the spaces look like. Uh, there's a large IMAX dome. Uh, these are some of the interiors of the galleries. And uh, the building is, is being thoroughly studied in terms of cross ventilation and comfort and all of the, uh, you know, the factors that make a good project. And last but not least, uh, the fourth project is a site, uh, is a building we did in Bitspilani, Rajasthan. Now to put it in perspective, this is the hottest place in India. It hits uh, around 50 degrees centigrade in summer, and it goes down to around minus one in winter. So it's a, it's a place of extremes. And there is an existing old 75 to 80 year old campus that existed on this site. It's probably number three or number four engineering campus in all of India. So if you see on the bottom left of your screen, that's the existing architectural style. And if you see on, uh, you know, in any of the other images, all of the buildings around have their architectural style. And fortunately, unfortunately, the only space available to create a building was smack in the center of all of this heritage. So either it was gonna be uh, create another heritage looking building that sort of matched the architectural style or the approach that we went was with, was to create a building that essentially had no architecture. Uh, and also what's very important is there's a, uh, the second image from the top, top row. There's an old clock tower, which is about 80 years old. And exactly across it is a, a Saraswati temple. Uh, that's the goddess of uh, prosperity. So it had a very strong uh, visual axis. So the design uh, uh, solution that we went in with, which you see on the bottom right of the screen, and now uh, this was the model that we submitted as part of our entry, was to actually submerge the entire building below the ground, uh, simply lift up the ground plane by about two feet and have an entire campus of students down below uh, while retaining all of the existing architectural heritage and character of the campus intact. Obviously this design changed. We had to reduce the cost and think more about natural light and ventilation. Uh, but that's what the final campus looks like. You can see the Saraswati temple at the far end, uh, which is at road level, that's the street level. And you can see this entire campus, which is submerged uh, below ground, but at the same time with a lot of light, uh, ventilation, all of that. That's an aerial photograph from the top of the clock tower, looking down at the campus. So all you see are these four staircase-like structures that come above ground and uh, the whole campus is, is down below. And this is an image at night of what uh, the whole campus looks like. So I'm just gonna run a short two and a half minute video uh, that'll give you a good feeling of what this place looks like.
Yeah, so that's it from me, Johnny. And uh, I'm going to stop the screen share now. Sorry, that's my call. Oh, cute. Say, boy. Uh, the two now. <laughs> the two. Two, two right. boys. Oh, beautiful no, work. One, 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 I'm very envious. Like, so, uh, <laughs> everyone has these huge, giant ideas, city involving changing beautiful buildings. No. When I show my work, it's going to be no God. <laughs> Not even a comparison, but beautiful works. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope to see you one day in, in, um, in India, and then we can hopefully we can exchange more. Absolutely. I just want to thank everyone for taking the time and, and joining in. And just want to end a small note in saying that uh, uh, I think everyone said that, but you know, uh, all of the studios are doing well because of the collaborative nature. And, and that's so important in, in this whole, and that's something we learned at Columbia. So I just want to end on that note. Thank you. Beautiful. And may I just interject uh, at the end of Carl's uh, presentation here that uh, he works for Javi's contractor who is also a GSAP alumnus actually um, from the AUD program. So that also partly explains the large scale of the projects and we, had the pleasure of having Haviz speak to students about two years ago now. Um, so it, this is really nice to get a, another look at the kind of work that's coming out of the studio. So thank you for presenting, Carl. Thank you for the opportunity. Santosh, are you ready? Hello, yeah, Santosh, how are you? Hi, Johnny. How are you? Good. Good. I, I hope you guys are well in India. Yeah, it's, it's getting uh, it's a little chaotic, but uh, we're all taking up precautions. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, you know, we have a speedy recovery for Priyam Wada, and I think the bigger cities are the most affected. So, so hopefully, another week or two weeks, uh, things will subside down. Uh, right. But yeah. Uh, Stay safe. So Santosh yeah. is a friend in Colombia. He's now a partner in Shamugam Associates. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, which is located in Trichy and Chennai, correct? And the firm has been operating since uh, 1982, and uh, it's been it has a large influence over uh, Trinchi and Chennai. So we look forward to your work. Thank you. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, thanks, Johnny and GSA for all the efforts uh, for doing it. Uh, I know it would have taken a lot of coordination, but thanks, thanks for doing it. So, I just share my screen now. Yep, yeah, all good. Yeah. Yes, yep. Yeah. Able to see my screen? Can, shall I start? Yes, please. So good. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I thought I'll just start like a journey of what I did after the COVID, the uh, GSAP, uh, which at uh, 2006. So from 2006 to 2010, I was working in Oppenheim at Miami. Uh, I always had this idea of coming back to India. So I wanted to choose a place where uh, you know, still want to work in the US, but we want to come back with some kind of learning what was done there. So we chose Miami because it's as close to India in terms of the climate, the vegetation, uh, landscape, because of the hurricane and the, you know, the concrete nature of the buildings, the whole city. I, I, I could see I could relate to many things uh, and uh, whatever learning that's been done, I thought it could be brought back here. So that's one of the reasons I chose that. I was lucky enough to get in there and I used to work uh, on a varies of projects. I was there for four years, four and a half years, uh, different scale projects, uh, hospitality sector and the residential, uh, certain interiors, uh, high rises, mid rises. You know, we had a good exposure of all these kind of different projects at Oppenheim and many projects in the Middle East as well. So it kind of gave a lot of openings and ideas, uh, you know, to realize interesting ideas to make it practical uh, and make it you know all kind of still uh, have a cutting edge but still be developed 
friendly and uh, the idea of yes, uh, that, that was interesting part over there. So based on that, and after 2010, I came back to India. Uh, and for today, I thought uh, I just shared two of the projects that's been done in the last you know, seven or ten, ten years since I've come. Uh, from 2010, I've come back and joined a firm. Uh, like you know, my father is an architect as well, so we joined we joined this firm, and my wife and my another partner. So we are like a small team of four architects uh, who handle all the projects. So the first project is a school that we have done in uh, Rajkot. Uh, Rajkot is in Gujarat. It's in the northern part of India. Uh, it's a it's a very dry part of the country and uh, closer to the desert. Sometimes the temperatures can go really uh, very harsh, up to the you know 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. So the first time we this was a competition also which we won initially and then uh, we went on to do it. The first idea was to here in India we have all these schools back in traditional times where it's called Gurukulam, uh, where teaching actually happened below a tree uh, with a guru kind of teaching you and uh, the idea was also learn from a uh, learn with nature and kind of you know learn uh, from nature as well uh, on on outdoors. So we thought if it would be nice if we can bring back this idea somehow of having a garden or an open space for a school for all classrooms. So this was the seed of thought with which we started the idea and we started to see how that could be multiplied for a bigger classroom that happening in all classrooms. So we started to have gardens for every classroom that have shared spaces. These are the spaces, you know, after construction, like the, how it starts to look like. Uh, every space in the classroom kind of open to a green space, either on one side or on, either on two sides. Uh, we thought that would be the best way to kind of feel refreshed in a class uh, rather than being uh, you know, enclosed. And all these classrooms, because of kindergarten and other levels, it's kind of interconnected. So all the garden and courtyards could be easily monitored from the other staff or the other persons as well. Uh, so these are again little examples of how the you know, gardens start to pan out. Uh, this was the design idea with which we started uh, because the site was quite big here and uh, we didn't have that much of uh, limitations in terms of size. So we started to design what would be the ideal way a classroom can have. We you know, kind of designed a little class uh, idea of a garden, uh, a smaller garden, a shared garden and try to multiply that into a cluster and then multiply it without losing the essence of the whole idea. And then we have these little perforated brick walls surrounding each classroom. So that kind of reduces the heat also. Sometimes there are sand storms, which kind of uh, stops that. And uh, also the little oh, jali kind of cools down the air that comes in. And also security. You know, security is also a key part in schools in India. So like basically, we have so many students that you don't want them to be loitering around and you don't know where they are. Uh, especially kindergarten to you know grade 10 schools, they're very concerned about students being inside the campus and not roaming around. So there's a little more detailed idea of how the perforations, the jali, the classrooms and start to work. Uh, that's the entire site plan. Uh, as you can see, this is the where the red is marked is the schools. Uh, we designed like five phases and currently phase one is done and phase two we'll be probably doing it next year or something. Uh, the client already has like an you know, engineering campus uh, colleges and other infrastructure. So this was a site that was dedicated for the school. So we tried to work within that and have some shared facilities which could happen a ground or swimming pools with the university. Uh, in terms of form, when we started, we thought we'll have like a very simple form that kids could relate it to. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea was to you know, bury in all the services and with the local manpower available there. Uh, but kind of the, still have the ultimate building to look like a, you know, a blocks or a Jenga blocks and have that idea replicated till the end, uh, where all the kids could relate to the form that we are trying to do. So that was the initial idea. So that's how the building started to look. So you could see the perforated walls. It's called Bela limestone. We did some research for locally available materials, and it was a very affordable stone also. It was very cheap. So we kind of chose that, and that runs on the periphery of the building. And we kind of wanted to have a similar experience for the upper level as well, because uh, you know to have a green space with you know from the windows, and also this also works like a screen, kind of uh, cutting down any dust that comes from the other. So we have like a, a green screen on the upper level and the bricks that happen on the lower level. So this was during execution. It was a new material, so we didn't know how to go about it. So we had a lot of things back and forth at site, and then kind of came up. With a pattern with the local workers of how it could be done. There's a lot of wind, so we have to consider a lot of lateral pressure 
and Gujarat is also an earthquake prone area, so we have to consider that kind of planning also happens. So these are the plants. Uh, these are certain corridors which will be connected in other places. So you know we, we try to plan all the phases so that all these services and you know connected services are integrated when all the phases are done. It looks unified as one building rather than disintegrated or different parts of the building. Move on quickly. That's how the building starts to look like. The major building is a ground plus one structure. The second floor is just for a seminar hall or other functions that happen at some point. But uh, operational ones are regularly in the first level. And uh, these are the spaces where kids kind of wait where the buses or, or the other vehicles come to pick them up. I'm not clear in the picture, but we painted some interesting space shuttles, you know, like uh, uh, astronauts and other things on the pavers where kids are kind of relate to when they walk towards the school. So these are deep overhangs, which kind of brings uh, you know shade to the lower walls. And here we are actually envision to have swings and other kind of structures where students can do uh, when they are waiting for a bus or between you know uh, towards the end of the schools. Gujarat is very well known for step wells. Uh, you know, if you Google in and you can find a lot of step wells that's there in the ancient past. And we wanted to have some reference to it, but we're doing a project there, but not directly getting too much into it. So this is like a space in the center which connects all the classrooms and you can also go through the upper levels and it also acts like a small open air theater and it works like a little green lung for the entire campus you know you come there and you see green in the middle of the desert and it gives you like a nice uh, opening space so they have all their morning little meetings assemblies like a little fancy this competition small graduations so this is like a nice space and we did some shadow studies to ensure that there's no sun except from 12 to 2 most of the other times it's in shade uh, you know, it's very important in India as much as we bring in light, but also shade because it's it's too hot and especially for kids, it, it's not a nice thing. This is some image of the library where it has like its own garden. To restrict certain movements also, we tried our best to, uh, you know, since being a school to get it done with vegetation rather than any metal work to plant it. So that's how the spaces start to look like. I'll move on to the next school. This school was done around 2018, sometime like you know, a year before the pandemic. Uh, so this is a, a CSR school for an automobile conglomerate. Uh, it was interesting because uh, they have a budget in mind. So they kind of came to us and said, within a year, you have to find a site, build a school and get to them operational in a year. So from site selection, we had a lot of things part of it and the timeline was very critical because in schools in India generally opens around in you know April. Uh, so that is saying whenever you can start at any time, but you have to hand it over in April. So we had like a year to find a site, do the thing, and then again on the budget. We were to give you a thumb rule, we were getting around 25 to 30 dollars, uh, you know, in converting Indian rupees. That's the budget that was given for this building. So that's the site uh, when we initially started. We identified, and that's the site we came. Uh, unlike the earlier project, this school the, the site was limited, and with this, you know, we have this little volume. Uh, that where the building could happen and all the other open spaces had to be given based on bylaws. Uh, most of the schools here when we went, we saw that, you know, it, we didn't have like a covered space. Yeah. You know, most of the places where people have to work or have their lunch, either they have to, you know, they're using the classroom or go outside in a tree in a shape. Uh, we identified a rural place here uh, so that, uh, you know, that it's beneficial that since it's being a corporate social responsibility, we want it to be actually done. So, uh, and these kind of places, Delhi has doesn't have infrastructure in terms of shade to have multiple other activities that happens in the school. Sometimes, you know, they have karate classes, uh, they have chess board, and all these generally are done in a haphazard way in between classrooms or, you know, in other spaces. So we try to locate something like that which is shaded, and then all these other activities which happens 24 by, you know, sorry, uh, the entire school to happen there. And again, these are different phases. Uh, Phase one is then phase two. Currently, we are doing it. It's getting over in a month. So then we did some local analysis of microclimate and started breaking these volumes into real small volumes. And then we started bridging connections to satisfy fire norms and you know, closure uh, for every classroom to reach an exit. And then this is even more breaking down the volume. To, you know, the, the major wind direction is northeast and southwest, and again in west also. So all these little things again. This also is part of the town where the temperatures can go. Most of the places in summer, it touches 40. So we wanted to ensure to have shade and wind because that's the only way we can make the you know uh, an environment comfortable here. So uh, we need indirect light, but we need direct wind. So we try to work with that idea uh, and bring these volumes. Now the idea with idea is to stop all the volumes. 
because we thought that will kind of bring in a cross ventilation for all the spaces and all the hot air could be dissipated. And we kind of worked with like a perforated roof. This was the shaded roof that I was talking earlier. And uh, this building also tried to work with not have any sharp edges. So the entire building has like curved edges, columns, and uh, we thought it's a little more friendly way of uh, you know attending school uh, for school for children. And uh, that's how the plants started to uh, shape up. This is just a phase one, phase two. Uh, we did a little research of the neighboring uh, village here. So there is a lot of temples, a lot of little hamlets here. So these, this temple on the left is around like 4,000 years old. And uh, they had these, it was constructed in different period of time. And so the architecture there kind of has these different layers where every dynasty or every kingdom kind of tried to finish it and neglect it. At and you could see a similar line of laying happening in other buildings, residences, which they've left it open. Uh, it is majorly for structure, like you have a heavy base and a lighter, you know, a, a substructure and then a roof is even more thinner. And it was nice that they left all these layers exposed. It was quite interesting when you walked down that we have seen. So we started to use this kind of a little laying idea into our buildings as well. So that's how the building started to you know, work, uh, what it will look like. And again, we had very limited time. This whole building was constructed in like eight months, where which we have to resolve all the ideas. So wherever in the west and other parts, we had to give deep overhangs to consider uh, for heat generated, you know, as you can see in these surfaces. And this is the western part, so we don't have windows here, windows open on the other side. Again, here gardens, wherever there are, all the kindergarten has their own little garden. So all that kind of opens up again to cut in air, security ideas. So the building starts to look like. So this is the interior space I talked of. Right now we have another phase two here, which is equally or bigger than this phase, and both connects and it's it's much nicer now. Uh, I can share it maybe in a month when the entire construction is done. So this is the operated roof I talked of. It creates in students between classes and other times. It's it's like a nice you know kind of learning light and architecture in the class uh, between classes. So it, it's, it's much interesting than like a regular, uh, so we thought that's uh, uh, one that we tried here for the roofing. And the spaces inside. So these are again kindergarten classrooms, like I mentioned, all classrooms are interconnected. We try our best to less, you know, visually connect any chances for abuse and other, all staffs could be kind of monitored, even if one is not there, uh, take care of minimum storage, whatever that happens. So the Jali is where we have all the windows, we try to avoid metals uh, and then kind of work with terracotta and have the same language. This again reduces heat coming in uh, and also ties in the language of the building, which we work for the, with a local mold which we developed. So that's how the space inside looks like now. And uh, this is a stage again now which we use that for all multi-purpose activities, have the lunch and all the activities that happen. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I saw this project in Art Daily. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty we, cool. Yeah, this COVID yeah. had us to, yeah, to help us uh, because we were quite bad on, on social media or publishing. So this okay. so COVID kind of helped us in that time because we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> Office, so we thought might as well start putting some of our work and right. It's beautiful. It shows a lot of culture and heritage, and I think that's that's really important, uh, especially in Asia, that we're, where we're trying to have our own voice. Um, really great work. Okay, so the next speaker is me myself. I'm moderating myself. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Johnny. And um, I'll do a screen share soon. I think that's it. <laughs> Oops. I just bought a new Mac, so take some time to change a little bit. Oh no. <sighs> okay, give me a second. I'll jump back on very quick.
While we wait for Johnny, um, I'd love to hear, I mean, your projects are so amazing, um, but so much of it um, is a reflection of the local conditions. And I'm just curious, like, how has your training um, outside of your respective countries sort of uh, helped inform or prepare you for, for what is very regional? Uh, yeah, I, I listen. Thanks, thanks for that question. No, actually, uh, the idea that we learned there was more on uh, the whole idea to have an interesting idea and getting realized it without diluting over a period of because of necessary budget, costing, estimate. So, uh, because the, the firm where I worked also was very uh, attributed towards sustainable solutions, towards climate and the intent was always to realize it and not get lost in the process. That kind of really helped us in, uh, you know, to stick to your ideas till the end, uh, whatever happens. So we took that as a base and then kind of tried to do it the same over here, uh, with the same sincerity and uh, budget with local uh, climate that we've been studying. So. Uh, I, I thought we were quite climate sensitive over there also. So we're kind of extending the same when we're doing a project in here or anywhere else. So, yeah. That's the... Thank you. It's, I mean, that campus is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize Johnny was going to be back so quickly, but Carl or Abdullah, if you had anything to add to that. Um, and then we can move on to uh, Johnny. I just want to say that, uh, you know, the one thing that uh, at least uh, I personally learned at the GSAP is that, uh, you know, half the things that you think that you should not be thinking about, I think graduate school and good professors teach you that, you know, you can think about anything and keep testing it out till you yourself are convinced that it's a bad idea. <laughs> and then you pick and choose between the good ones and the bad ones. So it was that that moment of, I, I don't know at which point you reach that moment. Uh, maybe it takes, sometimes it can take a decade till you reach that moment of understanding, not to feel scared to test out any idea. And at least personally, that's what I learned at Columbia. Abdullah, did you have something to add? Uh, no, no, uh, no, sorry. Actually, uh, I was away for a, a few moments. I didn't hear you. Before. Oh, I was just uh, remarking how how amazing your projects were, but they were so um, reliant on the local conditions for their success, and how learning abroad has uh, been able to prepare you to work locally. And so far, we've heard personal conviction and. Uh, you know, being able to test out and be experimental in your design. Uh, I th uh, I think um, the the basically the knowledge uh, the knowledge we um, uh, basically the knowledge we got from uh, GSAP, and also we also worked on projects that are outside uh, the U.S. and so on, even through uh, the, um, the education. I think that. that that give us basically tools to um, to navigate uh, projects in different uh, uh, contexts or different locations and so on, and try to understand uh, uh, sometimes some, uh, very quickly because you have a, a competition with a tight deadline. You need to understand what's really happening in a very short time to be able to uh, design. Uh, Design and be, and have something that's actually relevant to the place you're designing to. So I think it's um, I think that's one aspect of it that is more um, everything becoming more global, more international. Everyone is uh, like even I'm in the UAE. I'm when I'm competing in com local competition for even sometimes small projects. Uh, there are people from abroad also competing. So. Uh, um so that's there everything is becoming more more global international and we need to be able to think quickly to to really um, tackle different issues right 
the cultural competency that maybe um, being in a very diverse classroom has helped. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I wanna move on to Johnny's presentation, but that just brings to mind that our incoming class is actually represents 50 different countries this year. So we're, we're really excited um, about the global perspective in the classroom and having this symposium represent the alumni community so well. Um, so thank you and uh, Johnny. Okay, let's see. let's hope this works. Let me try. Let me know if it doesn't. I guess it's sharing. It's all good. Looks great. Looks good. Okay, perfect. I right, time myself and the moderator. I gotta keep on time. <laughs> okay, great. Um, really super super happy to be with everyone. I think the fifteen years. I'm also very surprised of all my colleagues and teams, what they have been doing. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll head into the presentation straight away. It's been 15 years since our graduation. Uh, started all in New York, Columbia University, and what a 15 year it has been. Um, I was digging up some old photos of us as me 15 years back. <laughs> Um, this was a beautiful uh, collaboration, discussion, and throwing ideas around with everyone. And most importantly, the parties, the parties. Um, I think I remember it happened on the uh, Friday night, right? And then also the parties at home. So yeah, don't forget that. Um, these are most memorable moments. I always thought I, always thought I would stay in the US um, or go to England or back to Japan or back to the Australia. Um, but it was not until an illness that really captured me, that uh, removed me from all the physical abilities and literally just allowed me not to go anywhere and just stay in the hospital bed. So unfortunately, life didn't go as planned. After two years in New York, I had to go back to Taiwan for some treatments. Um, and was during the, the treatments, um, I got known by uh, my ex-employee that the ex-employer that he was doing a competition and he wanted me to join him. And I thought, no, what better way to spend the hospital bed than to draw some uh, 3D models and do some drawings. So there we go. Um, so um, I started to do sketches, 3Ds and presentations and submitted the competition. And then um, two months later, um, we won the competition, and now it's the um, uh, sits in uh, New Taipei City. Uh, it's for Taipei uh, University Library. It was a really cool thing for me because somehow it led me to believe that Taiwan government and the Taiwan environment has this ability to to, to innovate itself and um and be better than it was it was it was so so before and so i really had this confidence that i should come back to taiwan and build my company which is jc architecture and then i uh, invited my girlfriend and now wife to join the company so we are about 10 11 years in and uh we have about 25 staff um in the beginning it was really hard struggles because i was trying to bring in all these experience and learnings and cultural things from the West. And so there was a very big clash of communication ideas between all my clients. Everything about here is about time and constraint and budget. But after a few years, we understand rather than using a Western mentality, let's do something that the Taiwanese clients can understand. Let's talk about language of time and budget. Um, and how can we design faster and cheaper. Okay, so there are a couple of breakthroughs. Um, I don't have any huge projects like my previous colleagues, uh, but I want to show like how fun and, and the kind of interesting projects that we are testing and prototyping in Taiwan. So this Bebes was one of the first projects that allow us to speak to an international audience. I mean, at that time when we, it was in uh, 2012, at that time when we got into Arc Daily it was like, yeah, we made it, um, but it was quite fun. Uh, it's a very tiny project from 45 square meters. It was for a cupcake store. Um, and so we thought about you no know, cupcakes. Can we use the idea of folding to create the shop itself? 
So basically we show the client that, okay, let's fold it. We show the, the client, let's fold this shop like this. And so on the left is the actual cupcake box. And on the right is how we did the model. So the two languages after completion shares the same denominator that when you walk into the store, you can feel the idea of the cupcake brand that we want to encapsulate inside the shop. So everything was, was done very quickly, day one, day 10, day 27, finish, voila. And the clients were pretty happy. I mean, there was a lot of ideas about how to save budget and time on this project. For example, if I use this thin board and we fold it up, we create a nice job. But what's more interesting is we allow for everything to be white. That means picking the material is easy. We didn't have to do a shop front and discuss what the shop front uh, elevation was. Plain piece of glass that extruded to the, the, the street facade and voila, becomes a little icon and symbol on the street. Um, we then thought, wow, this idea of thin is becoming very interesting. Everything in Taiwan has some kind of that history of being fast and cheaper. And so like all these advertising boards or these canopies, this plastic. And we got really, um, it, it relates to Leslie's question about you know, how do we use heritage and how do we, what do we think about? Johnny, your volume. Huh? I'm sorry? Volume. Volume. Oh. Am I speaking too, too soft? Yeah, it's good Is now. It better? It's good? Okay. So yeah, we wanted to test these ideas of the thin. So for example, this paper church, um, yeah, why not we try and test that? And so the idea of manufacturing and testing came into our head. And so with this next project called Happier Cafe with only $4,000, so $10 per square meter, we got the, we got the idea of if we, you can, if we can use the idea of paper to build the space that we can express ourselves as well. It also happens to be in the library. So we bought these giant, huge rolls of paper and then we started tests. Is it possible to use paper? Uh, is it possible to use paper and to build a space? Will the paper rip itself? Will the paper, you know, um, as much? So we 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 love these ideas of testing, and we started to play around with it. We started to draw shapes in, in terms of uh, the different functionality to spaces, and then we test it out in real time. Yeah. So this is the final result of the the happier cafe space. And then people were starting to write and dance and express themselves inside. We were then also invited to Tokyo uh, with this, um, this project. And this time we were having a, a, a even bigger site. We were able to work with very big brands like B&B Italia. So this very cheap idea, a very fast idea, working with the best furniture makers in the world. It's really uh, crazy and astonishing to me. So the, the, the practice, JC architecture, is really a lot of ideas of testing the possible productions and material ideas and technologies that we can source locally in Taiwan and then try to push the boundaries in terms of design and spatial ideas. The next project is, uh, again, a, a, a tiny one. It's the Fine Art Museum in Taipei. Um, this building was built in the 70s. Uh, it, it's a really, really tiny shop, but because the, the building itself is built in the 70s and the architect used the idea of metabolism. So we also wanted to see, is it possible to extend the shop beyond this tiny little room? Is it possible that we use the metabolism ideas and push forward the living machine idea so that the shop expands into the giant lobby area? Testing, one. Again, we do a lot of prototyping and testing uh, inside factories that are only 20, 20 minutes away. So it's kind of the idea that, you know, we, uh, it's like the garage idea in the Silicon Valley. We test a lot of things inside our little factory. And then, um, 
yeah, we try. For example, this is a, a sitting test, test idea. We wanted to the, the the shelf to go 4.6 meter into the space. Um, so we needed to test as a possible uh, to have this length, but without any deflection. As you can see, the testing works uh, with very small deflection. Um, we spent about two weeks to fit out the shops and it's now becoming one of the tourist uh, attractions. It, it's a it's very simple concept, 4.6 meter shelf, uh, able to rotate it inside the space. There was a very uh, exciting moment when I had to jump onto the shelf in front of all the media and the press, and we have models walking up and down um, just to test the structural integrity of this, this shop. So the last project I want to quickly share is a, it's the most fun project, exciting project for me. Uh, last year, 2019, uh, two years ago, the, the Taiwanese railway train designed a train like this. Crazy. It's blue seating and little colorful flower petals and blue ground and like crazy lighting and like almost like a hospital, right? So um, we were all very sad and we wanted to propose an idea of a redesign of the train. We call it the moving beauty that we literally wanted to encapsulate all the Taiwanese landscape beauty into the train, maybe by removing all the barriers from the inside to the outside. So as the train moves, there's a lot of connection between what we see outside and what we actually feel and smell and, and eat again. So that was it. We proposed the idea and uh, we won the, the bidding. And um, yeah, this is the, the locomotive design. It was a design process about seven months, two months design, five, five months construction. And the beauty of it, it's not using a new train. It's using a 70 year old train that try to also encapsulate a lot of the culture and the heritage of the old train itself and making this train the tourist train around Taiwan. It was uh, finally revealed uh, to the public in December 31st, 2020. So I don't know, my boy's dream was to go designing transportation. So this was a really crazy dream project for me. And now I have more bigger appetites, um, designing a yacht, designing a plane or even a rocket. And uh, my first yacht design was also just revealed um, about a month ago. Yeah, so a lot of opportunities in Taiwan and we want, really want to capture everything. But allow me just 30 seconds more. I wanna share um, a program that we've been doing. It's called Out Scholarship. It's, it's kind of uh, after the kidney fund that the Columbia gave it to us for us to travel um, and learn new experience. So when I came back to Taiwan uh, 13 years ago, um, I also wanted to do something similar. So uh, we provide also each student $3,300 for Taiwanese students to travel around the world and also for foreign students to come to Taiwan. So there's a different exchange on culture, on uh, knowledge and on work experience. So if you have students or if you are students yourself, welcome to participate in this award and um, 
and let's exchange and interact. Thank you. It took a, a little bit longer than that. Amazing I stuff, Johnny. Not bad. <laughs> you have okay, a great. <laughs> so, I mean, we are the, we are the lucky group. We are a little bit, I mean, we only have five, um, but I guess we, we, we can spend a little time. If there's no questions, we can spend a little time to talk about uh, cultural aspects, talk about, yeah, like Leslie was asking what Columbia has taught us. Um, I'm really glad that because a lot of our, sorry, Johnny. Go ahead. Yeah. A lot of our audience is uh, current students and incoming students, um, as well as alumni. And of course, our alumni are already um, in practice, but I think there's a lot of curiosity um, because our student population is so global, um, how that translates to working both in New York as an international um, graduate, but also bringing that sort of way of thinking um, back to their countries of origin. Um, so that's where that, that um, question came from. But I also wanted to mention that Johnny is the new president of the CAA Taiwan. So any questions about <laughs> transitioning to the alumni community, he's also available um, for that. So we don't have any questions right now, but Johnny, maybe you have one for, for the cohort here. Well, I thought, I mean, it's 9 p.m. here. So I thought maybe we can start with a happy hour. I don't know if everyone has a drink on the hand. <laughs> maybe do something. That's for Fridays, Johnny. Really beautiful whiskey in Taiwan called Kavalan. Tastes like chocolate. <laughs> No, it's, it's really great because uh, Colombia allow us to, to have friends all over the world. And I think that's the, the most beautiful part. So whenever we go, we, whenever we want to collaborate and share ideas, um, I think that's what Colombia taught us. Not to be afraid and also push forward. I also, I always tell my students, Colombia gave us 30 years of education to see the future. So we used up 15 years. We have 15 more years and then we have to go back to school. <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, so I think um, my biggest hurdle coming back from Colombia was to actually use that language with my clients. Um, like I said in the presentation, I had a lot of struggles, but eventually I find the methodology and the procedures uh, that were taught in Colombia was very useful for me. Um, that if I don't if I, if I, sorry, if I use that methodology to rethink my thinking process, but insert the local ideas and culture and heritage and memories, that allows me to speak to my client in a local way, but also allows my work to speak in the, to an international audience in a way that it's not only Western and Western, it's really Taiwanese. And Western, and I think that's what's beautiful about me coming back here. I don't know about your experience. Um, would you like to share some ideas, guys? Yeah, I don't coming oh. in here. Right. So, uh, I think Johnny, you said the right thing that you know uh, at the start you try and implement uh, you know what you've learned and what you think is the right idea, but very quickly you sort of come back to you know level Earth. And you realize that you, you need to implement your ideas while communicating it in a certain way. So that's also one of the things that Columbia did teach us. The, the, the crits were quite tough. And, you know, you had to get your ideas communicated in a way that the person that you expect to receive your idea understands it. So there's the idea and then there's the communication. And then how do you bring the two together? So yeah. that uh, coming from, you know, uh, starting starting life in in this part of the world and then learning in another part of the world and then coming back thinking you know everything and then realizing that you actually don't and then you sort of put it all together and and, and try and forge a uh, you know some kind of understanding of it is is a slow journey that can only be gathered through experience Josh? Yeah. for colombia 
is great, you know, like you talked earlier about the 30 years. Uh, I thought it's even more than that because uh, it, kind of, you know, it kind of opened up all the opportunities. Like uh, the school was great in the sense that it doesn't direct you in one particular mode of architecture or one particular idea. It kind of lets you do whatever you want uh, in any medium at that point. It could be a film, it could be movies, it could be architecture in and all kind of architecture were kind of given equal importance and exposure to everyone. So that, uh, I, I thought it was like migrating and opened up all the ideas, uh, you know, coming from India. Uh, we were a little in close or traditional, some certain ways of thinking. And I thought that kind of opened up, uh, gave us limitless opportunities to any design. And uh, uh, I, I would credit a lot of that kind of thinking process really you know, started after the Columbia. And the next thing was, uh, uh, like Carl and Vivian mentioned, to communicate those ideas, you know, to get it in front of an audience and get your idea communicated, which I thought I was kind of lacking back then and trying to still learn that process, like you mentioned. But uh, I, I really thought that uh, it's a school really helped us to open up and uh, doesn't limit our thinking and, uh, and kind of then get it done, you know, uh, with the whole idea of making it happen. Uh, really pushed us, and uh, uh, you know, I, I thought that was very, very critical at that point. And uh, I was still getting benefited from that, of, of that exposure and that opening up. Yeah. Great. Abdullah, you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, for, um, uh, for me, it's uh, actually it's a, bit, a little bit different from, um, uh, in, in the sense that, you know, the population of the UAE, is about 10 million. Only 1 million is actually local population. So during our education, even in the UAE, uh, basically all the all the faculty were non-Imaratis. Um, so, the, the, so the studios in the UAE and even in, in New York, in terms of the way of communication and the ideas and so on, that it has been taught by someone who is not, who, who is not living in the UAE, who has not lived for, in the UAE for a long time. So um, in terms of communication and language, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a continuation of the same trend. But what I know, what was uh, for me, the challenge uh, for me was, okay, I'm, I'm an Emirati, I went and studied uh, abroad at one of the top universities in the world, and then I come back, okay? So uh, how do you show that or how do you, um, how do they, how do they accept that? Because when, for example, when I go to a client, you know, a client to present it with, whether it's public or private client, the first thing he will ask me, who who is in your team? Who else is in your team? What nationalities are working with you? Okay, I'm at least at some point in the office, I was the most qualified person in the office, but they don't see that. And okay, you 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 know, you could you could work with this person and see what you get. So they started working with that with that architect in the office and so on. And then Abdullah, the result is not the same. Uh, now I know that it's you know it's your input that's important and so on. So that's that's not easy to get through. That you know, uh, 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 so that that's the one of the difficulties. And another thing also, just also our population is you know local population is limited as having uh, Emiratis who are actually doing, who actually have their own office, running their own practice and actually designing, uh, can be counted on, on the, you know, on, on, on two hands. It's not, it's not that much of a number. A lot of them go into public, uh, public sector private and, or um, uh, in the private sector. Uh, they do have their own businesses, but they're not as involved. So that, I think that was, Coming from abroad and showing that. Great, I understand your point. Yeah, definitely. We have one question from Planet. Uh, where do you feel there's more creative freedom as designers in public architectural private or developers? And uh, which clients are more receptive to your thoughts? Okay. Do you want to take it away? What do you say, Johnny? Uh, there's a question from Punet. Uh, what no, do you what, I'm huh? saying, what's your answer? Oh, what's my answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, I think, I mean... I don't think there is any client to be... Yeah, I don't think there's any client to accept that idea, I think. Uh, I mean, because this is a recorded session, so I can only answer oh. in a very political voice. <laughs> no, I mean, we all have a balance. I mean, we do public works to really you know, help the society and we do private works and we look for private clients that, look, that, uh, that understand who we are. And so it's very important for us to choose the right clients who are listening to our voice. Um, of course, there are money making projects there are also PR projects but we try to stand ground and not just say yes to everything we try to do what we like to do and after 10 years 11 years we now have our own voice and then so the right clients seek uh, us and then now so now it's much more easier down the line that we know they like our work and then so we help them uh, with the designs yeah okay so, finish. So, so for us, it was a struggle initially, you know, like to kind of like uh, Johnny mentioned the convey ideas and things like that. But but once you kind of go through the process and get some of your buildings built, at least in India, then you kind of start to get a little bit more of what you want. Uh, the earlier part was really tough. Uh, I think Carl would uh, be easier because. Uh, uh, you know, they have uh, like a huge projects and uh, they have a lot of experience on handling them. But when we do slightly a bigger project, and then if you want to try something new, uh, unless you haven't done something on a similar scale, it gets really tough in, to convince people back. But slowly now, since we started building and getting things done, uh, I think the client is listening a little bit more than, you know, or, or, or our designs are getting realized a little bit more than how it was earlier. I think to answer that question, the only way is to start building the way we want, and slowly we'll start getting people to let us do what we want. Uh, I, I guess that's the that's the way that we are at least finding a happening for us. Right. Yeah. Um, Dula, Kao, you want to share anything? And then we'll wrap it up for you guys. Yeah, I, I, and for, for me, it, it, dep it depends on the. Um, on the um, on the personality of the person I'm dealing with, whether it's private or uh, public, we have some public clients who basically uh, they want the project to finish quickly, so they're not gonna nitpick on everything as long as the overall vision is fine, and then things go really quickly. Actually, after that, some of them actually will will stick on every single square meter you have in the design, making sure we're not wasting public money on some extra that we actually can avoid. And uh, I think, uh, as Johnny said, once you start building a name, then you start to just more of the new ideas. Uh, um, the clients will start to just the, the ideas more. And I noticed the biggest difference is the client who comes because they think you're the, uh, believe they're the right firm for them, or designer for them. And there's a client who just listen, hear that you're a good firm and come to you. I think there's a very big difference between those two. Um, in terms of accepting your, uh, the ideas and, and building them. Great. I think um, what I'd like to say as an answer to that question is that uh, projects that come through you know, your door through repeat clients and stuff like that, there's always gonna be some amount of limited freedom uh, so at least in, in, in my personal experience and at our firm, what we try and do is, you know, once in a year, uh, at least do two competitions because that's the only way you can express yourself uh, fully and whether you win or lose doesn't matter because you're doing it for yourself. And uh, if, if, the, if, if, you know, the client picks you as the winning entry, then you kind of got what you wanted in the first place. So it's very important to do competitions, uh, not just for your own satisfaction, but also to, at least we feel so, to keep the studio nice and tight and sort of uh, activated and not get lazy. Because, you know, that's one thing we learned at Columbia that, you know, you've got to continuously compete and better yourself. And that's the only thing that you, you know, that's the way to get the best out of yourself. Very beautiful. Yeah. I got us. Um... We gotta do more competitions as well. 
I gotta stop making money. <laughs> okay, it's great. Um, I think I think Asia is the the next frontier. Um, we are very lucky in Asia to continue to have projects and discussions and in collaboration. So uh, I'm sure all of us are very receptive to students wanting to come to Asia um, and work with us. And um, well, we welcome you guys. The next session is in 12, uh, 12 p.m. your time, New York time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again to all the speakers. It was really great to see you guys, Santosh, Carl, and Abdullah. I hope we can do this soon again. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks for putting this together. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You, see you at noon. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.